to my limitations first limitation was it was difficult for me to find out the investors who have invested in esg companies my respondents were 140 in which only 110 were invested in esg company so again according to the period of the study as well as the different rules and regulations of the environment the companies are also facing to adopt sustainability practices to be eco friendly with the client as well as the environment as well as these factors to impact on their value of performance of share ma'am now second time conclusion so sustainability practices also contribute has proved that it also contributes to organizational performance but lesser than protection of sustainable practices of the companies which are higher in the environment so as i have already given in my recommendation the investors must be motivated to invest in esg companies which will contribute to the personal economical environmental growth of the country thank you thank you okay what is the contribution to us hello yes sir yes sir okay what is the contribution of the investors from the company side what is the returns they are finding in contribution how is the returns how is the returns, the returns from the Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So when we say when we invest into a company, it is always for a long term. When we invest for a short term and wait for a return, even in banking sector or in mutual fund sector, in any sector, the returns are low. But in ESG companies, due to their sustainability practices, for example, if it is a packaging company, they are using. plastic boxes other than uh, good materials like leaf or banana leaf yeah. the invest yes that boost up the goodwill of the company which reflects on their shares so the investors who wait for a longer period of the companies who are having and go for a long run and a good return right so what are the parameters you have taken to go in for the study uh one is the management of resources of sustainability protection of environment protection of shareholders interest and transparency and disclosure of information yeah nice thank you ma'am any questions thank you so much sir any questions Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, next, let's go. Uh, Thank you. The so next participant, Jesslyn Devi. Hello, sir, and uh, hello, participants. Good morning to everyone. So Good morning. I am Madhu Bhattuya. We can start sharing now. Is my screen visible, sir? It is visible. Yeah, thank you, sir. And I am Jason Devi from I'm studying bachelor degree in Madras Christian College, and my research topic on uh, study of analyzing the Gen Z's awareness on digitalization of bank assurance. And my co-author is Dr. Anjali Ma. Uh, first of all. bank assurance is a strategy where banks and uh, insurance company work together to uh, pen, to achieve the penetration level and to increase the insurance penetration level in the society uh, in in bank assurance bank get the bank sells the insurance product to the consumers and uh, 
bank gets the income the way of commission as well as the insurance company mm, increases its uh, sale of policy without increasing its worth that's a major benefit in the bank of things uh, but in the but the bank assurance was started in india uh, as since 2000 but uh, it was uh, finding familiarity in 2000 uh, 1920 because the outbreak of covid 19 and uh, in covid 19 the the consumers mostly prefer for digitalization method uh, and uh, in that the bank assurance faces the problem where there is a lack of advertisements and there is a lack of a digital platform so that it cannot uh, increase its sales in the covid period next the research gap is uh, there is many researchers on um, bank assurance it's a digitalization strategy uh, and the future of bank assurance but there is no researchers on interest of gen z's in bank assurance that is my research gap uh, and uh, this situation is caused due to the lack of digitalization and uh, lack of advertisement there are only two objectives in my study the objectives are finding the awareness level of the bank assurance and uh, analyze the consumer interest in the digitalization of bank assurance the research methodology and uh, the sample area is chennai and uh, it was a convenient sampling the sample size was 100 and uh, the sample period was uh, january 2023 the statistical tool i used was a simple percentage and the research instrument is i used the questionnaire for collecting the data from the respondents and i collected the primary data through questionnaire and secondary data through journals research articles etc etc uh, the finding from the from my studies uh, from the research percentage has the insurance policies and uh, 49 has sorry uh, 51 percentage has uh, the idea about the bank assurance and uh, 49 has no idea about the bank assurance uh, the main uh, the main reason for uh, the unawareness is uh, uh, the advertisements and digitalization and the 40 per 60% of the respondents are and from the respondents 59 percentage are, are uh, satisfied if the bank assurance model becomes a digitally if they, if they adopt digital platform uh, the 59 percentage of the respondents will be happy and uh, 33% 53 percentage of respondents feel the bank assurance should be aware di- digitally so that it will be more convenient and the conclusion from my study is that the the study was undertaken to find the interest and awareness level of the gen z's on the digitalization of bank assurance and uh, the research found that more uh, nearly half of the population do not have the idea of bank assurance nearly 49% percent they don't have the idea of the bank assurance and the the main reason was as i said uh, it was <laughs> Uh, the lack of digitalization and the advertisements uh, in the we the government and the bank should be work uh, towards uh, improving the digital platform like a uh, financial app uh, which the other uh, other dig, uh, digital other uh, insurance companies have like uh, policy bazaar so that the agencies will be attracted more because uh, after covid the most of the transaction are taking place through online uh, under the and and uh, if the availability of uh, digital app will uh, motivate the people more towards the bank assurance and my suggestion is that the creator and creation of the digital platform 
and uh, the bank also should promote more advertisement on uh, bank customers i think there is no advertisement regarding bank assurance in india so the banks to, should also work towards the digitalization and uh, advertisements of bank customers. the further the scope for further studies i only focused on gen z is there is also more population which has uncovered by me uh, and i took only two hindrances of bank customers namely the digitalization app and the advertisements there are also various problems faced by the bank customers for the less penetration they can also uh, take into consideration for for the future study thank you sir okay thank you okay uh, hello yes sir okay how you have collected the data collection sir it's from the secondary source mainly and from the primary sources through questionnaires sir the questionnaires are uh, circulated among the college students as well as uh, uh, in the the com- their family members mainly the college students and their family members mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the most of the respondents are in the age group of 20 below 20 and 28 as they are gen z and some of the family members respondent uh, so the respondents from the age group of uh, 30 to 50 is the limited respondents have been given okay you are saying about the apps which are not available how do you say that the app is very helpful whether it is very handy yes sir uh, i take the example of policy bazaar uh, okay. we can we can take insurance through policy bazaar uh, in instantly sir uh, and they also give more features uh, for in, uh, taking insurance so if we develop an app which is more handy and uh, more convenient for people uh, the coming generation and the present generation also will be more attracted and as well and the bank assurance has the assurance of the bank so they will get more attracted towards it see when you are saying that uh, digitalization then why should i go and claim it whether i have to physically go it or i have to go claim it on a digital platform you have done anything like this yes sir so building uh, claims on the digital will be more convenient uh, and the bank should do work on it sir because most of the response uh, where i have seen is they are unable to claim because they do not see they are claiming it but there is a rejection from the other end so physically mm-hmm. there is not available Okay then. Any questions? We'll move on to the next. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The next participant, C. A. Shashi. Namaskar, sir. Namaskar, everyone. Namaskar. I am audible. Yeah, you are audible, madam. Is my screen visible? Not. You share it. Is it well visible now? Mm. Yes. Yeah, it's coming. Namaskar sir uh, myself C A Shashi Kumawat from IIS Deem to Be University and under the supervision of Dr T N Mathur sir and uh, today my topic is an event study of stock market behavior during pre and post merger period of selected public sector bank so the first topic is introduction and uh, the merger and acquisition merger and acquisition is the process of merging two businesses into a single entity 
when two or more firms are combined the goal is to achieve synergy where the total is larger than the sum of its parts when one firm buys another and integrates it in, into its operations this is known as the acquisition whether the company being purchased believes it would be better off as an operating unit of more significant business the acquisition can be friendly or hostile the next topic is banking sector the banking industry plays deal in a variety of products from saving accounts to loans and mortgages offer various services from check cashing to understand under underwriting takers to different types of customers from individuals to large corporates serve diverse geographics from rural villages to cross borders operations thus the banking sector is made up of several types of banks with their own objectives roles and functions the shareholders the aggregate wealth conferred to the shareholders as a result of their participation in a company is referred to as shareholder wealth the member of board of directors have a fiduciary duty to the shareholders and a responsibility to protect their investment by operating the firm responsibly and is accordance with the industry standards failure to do so may please result in sanction please move the slide now uh so yes sir the merge bank in my study i have taken uh, these public sector bank which have merged from 2015 to till now and broadly there are five acquirers bank one is sbi another is pnb ubi canara bank and indian bank and they merged uh, about 10 banks from 2015 to till now and the event date which i have taken for this stock market purpose is mentioned here and the keywords which is used in my topic is stock market event study public sector banks mergers and acquisition and uh, cumulative average abnormal returns car the research topic uh, the research gap while i am researching various uh, various literature review based on reviews of papers of stock market behavior of banking sector following gaps were identified despite the topicality of the matter and its practical significance the possible impact of such a merger announcement on stock prices of a concerned banking sector has not been carefully investigated therefore the objective of this study to analyze the impact of the merger announcements of basically for the public sector banks on shareholders wealth using the event methodology covering the period from 2010 to 2020 and the objective of this study Can you move is slide? sorry sir your slide is not going Not, not moving, right? Yeah, right no. now? No. It is in the first slide. There is only first slide. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, now it is okay. Objective. Yes, sir. Now it is okay. Yeah, now it is okay. Objective. Okay. The objective of this slide, uh, the objective of this study, is to examine how a bank's announcement of a merger affected the. banks procurement of stock market pricing and we examined the stock prices changes prior to and following the announcement date to determine the effect on bank stocks uh, the hypothesis of this study is there is no significant impact of declaration of merger on cumulative average abnormal returns on and around the merger dates and the alternative hypothesis is there is a significant impact now the sample size and the data collection method this study covers the period from 2010 to 2020 a total of five public sector bank mergers and acquisition have taken place in india including 17 banks which has uh, bifurcated as five acquirer banks and 12 acquired banks the study sample consisted of five public sector bank listed on bse bombay stock exchange during the study period and were selected by meeting the following sample selection criteria the period is 2010 to 2020 and the bank must be listed on the bse portal and the data must be available during the period and 
for the purpose of the data collection i have used provis iq database now the data analysis tool for the accounting tool i have uh, i have used the uh, event methodology which covers the two window period one is 15 days window period and another is 30 day window period and for the statistical tool i have used the t test by using the spss software using the 5% level of significance and the test of this study is t test paired to sample of means of cumulative average abnormal returns and for the uh, 15 days window period and the for 30 days window period before the merger and after the merger and the p value comes for the 15 days window period is more than 5% and for the 30 days window period it comes to zero that is uh, less than 5% and the analysis and the interpretation for the 15 days window period is according to p value which is more than 5% that means there is no significant difference in cumulative average abnormal return of pre and post merger announcement dates it is concluded that, that within a period of minus 15 to plus 15 that is before and after the shareholders behavior is good after announcing the merger because they are using the purchase strategy and they favor this merger and for the 30 days window period as we already know that there is a p value which is less than 5% that means there is a significant difference in caar that is cumulative average abnormal return and uh, in this period we we have concluded that shareholders behavior is not good after announcing the merger because they are using the selling strategy the conclusion for this strategy uh, the conclusion for this paper is it is concluded that shareholders behavior has been observed using cumulative average abnormal return for 15 days window period and 30 days window period is So for the 15 days window period the shareholders behavior is positive and for the 30 days window period the shareholders behavior is negative here are the references thank you thank you nice presentation thank you sir okay what are the parameters you have taken into consideration for this 15 days and 30 days of shareholders Uh, so the parameters uh, in uh, various i have lit i have reviewed various literature reviews and i have taken many uh, window periods uh, which is which is covered around 45 days and the 60 days but but uh, there is less studies which is uh, taken the 15 days window period and 30 days window period that is why i have i have taken these window periods which have uh, already in uh, less existence Okay, recently I think uh, one particular bank of private sector has now gone in for the merger. That is HDFC Bank and HDFC Life. Yes, sir. Yes, HDFC Bank Limited has uh, merged, merged with HDFC with Limited. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Uh, how was the share was jumping? How was the shareholders? Uh, so basically, my study is. Uh, revolve around the public sector banks so sir i have no much idea about the private sector banks because my phd topic is also for the public sector banks which has merged uh, between the period uh, covering the 2015 to till now so they uh, yes they are given 2020 yes sir till now because uh, i have registered around 2022 so i am taking the period from 2015 to 2000 uh, till now that is 2020 you can see okay how was the shareholders reaction when there was a merger of sbi and its subsidiaries yes sir yes, uh, the i have taken the uh, sbi also and the overall impact um, in the another study i have also taken the 60 days window period and that 60 days window period the sbi shareholders reaction is positive i have also uh, started one paper which have covering the sbis covering the 60 days period and in that paper i have concluded that the shareholders perspective is positive towards the merger for the for covering the 60 days window period or not less than that yes sir Okay then. Thank you. Any questions? 
we'll move on to the next thank you sir thank you thank you the next participant deepika yes sir am i audible yeah you are audible now is my screen visible yeah it is yeah so my topic is about uh, factors influencing food saving schemes uh myself deepika and i am a student from madras christian college and my co-author is uh, dr anvi suresh assistant professor of, of commerce so uh, so post office uh, financial saving schemes have been a dependable and famous funding alternative for plenty of individuals especially in growing a country like india for individuals who stay in regions without banks the indian post office assists uh, uh, them in depositing their cash in post office or uh, financial saving scheme post office offers some of uh, financial uh, savings plans which include savings bank accounts national savings certificate accounts post office monthly income plans etc in general a uh, 50 percentage of adults have accounts with uh, one or one or more banks a uh, post offices are each well percentage of adults have accounts uh, with each banks and public and post offices and 3 percentage of adults have accounts with just post office worldwide uh, 28 percentage of adults use post office offerings to uh, to deposit cash and make payments this is because of various reasons just like the reality that uh, these schemes provide a fantastically uh, low debt funding alternative with the introduced advantage of being raised through the government post office saving schemes are uh, secure thrift free investment with excessive return on funding like this there are so many factors that tells people decision to invest in post office savings scheme so the research gap a uh, review of literature reveals that a lot of studies are conducted to check the overall investor attitude towards the various post office scheme usually ignoring explanations for it so this study focuses on filling the gap by analyzing the various factors that are influencing the investors to invest in post office savings scheme and my objective is to uh, study the factors influencing the people to invest in post office savings scheme and this is my research methodology uh, i used median sampling for my research purpose and it was conducted in the, uh, uh, this month this is january 2023 i used will form uh, uh, for uh, collecting the respondents and that is primary data so from this study uh, i found that the investors are extremely uh, interested and happy with depositing their uh, savings with the post office savings scheme majority of the respondents learned uh, post office savings schemes through relatives or through their friends the foremost necessary issue in using post office savings scheme is uh, found to be the interest rates uh, the amount of risk related to say uh, schemes was found to be a most vital factor which influences influences that Uh, schemes uh, which are thought of, thought of to be less key tend to be a lot of popular among investors. A uh, majority of the respondents felt that uh, lower deposit demand for such uh, saving schemes could be a nice future because it permits people of uh, all money backgrounds to benefit all those savings and begin building a better future for themselves. And in the conclusion, uh, we have. Uh, this analysis uh, provided a comprehensive understanding of the uh, various factors that influence the success of office saving schemes. Uh, promo- promoting uh, promoting saving schemes through a set of uh, channels, channels uh, like uh, channels and tactics like promotion fines, uh, giving incentives, providing smart coachings for post office agents will facilitate and extend access and attract new investors. in for a scope for uh, future uh, further research a uh, further study can be conducted to explore the impact of economic condition and post of saving schemes uh, this would include analyzing the effects of changes in economic conditions such as recession inflation and unemployment on the popularity of uh, post office savings schemes yeah, that's all sir thank you thank you nice hello yeah yes, sir okay uh what is the media they are using in to promote their post office saving to the customers sir i think uh 
till now there is not much promotion for post saving schemes it is better if uh, so many promotion uh, activities uh, if they if government takes necessary steps to promote uh, post office saving schemes then many people even from uh, middle class family or lower middle class family can make investment in these schemes because many of them are not aware about them okay how should they be motivated to given to increase their in uh, investment schemes to them yes yeah, so by increasing the uh, uh, interest rate and uh, uh, and the tenure of the uh, saving schemes like that sir because they have to meet out with the competitors of the other commercial banks yes yeah, sir okay I think it may be due to the micro level. Even in a <coughs> rural small villages, you can have the post offices, and that is moving them to go in for uh, investing in post office rather than going to a particular place and investing. That may be the reason. Yes. So nice. Any questions? Okay, we will move on to the next. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Very good morning to all of you. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Please. Is my screen uh, visible to you? No. Please share it. Now is it available? Uh, visible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's coming. Okay, myself Ankit Kala, a research scholar from IIS Deem to Be University. I am presenting my paper under the guidance of Dr. Mahima Rai, Associate Professor of IIS Deem to Be the University. The topic of my project, uh, my paper is a comparative study of balance sheet, income statement prepared under NAS and IFRS with special reference to Infosys Limited. So, introduction is like this. International financial reporting standards globally applicable standards of financial reporting issued by the IASB, that is International Accounting Standard Board. The government of India, along with ICAI, recognized the need of global standards. They decided not to follow IFRS the way they are, but to prepare their own financial reporting standards, which are commonly known as NAS. Hence, the Accounting Standard Board of ICAI formulated Indian Accounting Standards, properly known as NDAs. At present, there are 41 NDAs in India. NDAs or Indian Accounting Standards govern the accounting recording of financial transactions as well as the presentation of statements such as profit and loss account, balance sheet of the company. NDAs is framed keeping in mind the economic environment and disclosure requirement of Indian government. NDAs has evolved a compromise formula that tries to harmonize Indian accounting rules with IFRS. For presenting my paper, I have reviewed several papers as follows. And the problem which faced is this. Many companies are preparing two sets of accounts, that is one on NDAs and the other on IFRS basis. Hence, it becomes essential to study the compare the accounting ratio considering the balance sheet and income statement prepared under NDAs and IFRS of a company to find what is more beneficial convergence or adoption in full. Hence, we need an answer to the following question, whether there is any significant difference in the balance sheet and income statement prepared under NDAs or IFRS. The objective of the study is to explore the liquidity ratio, profitability ratio, activity ratio, leverage ratio, and cash flow statement of Enforcers Limited, and to identify the difference in balance sheet, income statement, prepared under NDAs and IFRS. The hypothesis is that there is no significant difference in the balance sheet, income statement, and the ratios, and other hypothesis is there is a significant difference in balance sheet, income statement, prepare under NDS and IFRS. Now, the population which I have seen is Indian ID company Infosys. The period of my studies is six years starting from 1st April 2016 to 31st March 2020. The area of study is limited to liquidity ratio, profitability ratio, activity, leverage and cash flow statement. 
The data I have collected in a secondary form from the annual reports of the financial year 2016-17 to 21-22. The method, statistical tool, and the data analysis has been done with the help of independent sample t-test. The results are as follows. When we see at liquidity ratios, we find there are no such difference up to two decimals. Up to two decimals, the ratios, especially the current ratios, is exactly same. When we move to profitability ratios, we find there are very minor changes up to 0.1 decimals. When we move to activity ratios, again we feel that there are very minute changes up to 0.2 decimals only. And when we move to leverage ratio, we find there are no such changes. When we find cash flow statement, we see that there is no such changes except some minute changes are there. The hypothesis results are there when we find liquidity ratio, we find the difference and variance are zero. Profitability ratio, the variance are very negligible. Activity ratios, the variance are under 1.5. Leverage, there are no changes. Cash flow, very minute changes are there. So the result is that as per the above uh, tables, the P value is greater than 0 0.05 in all cases. Hence, the null hypothesis is accepted and we can see that there is no significant difference of accounting ratio under NDS and IFRS. The conclusion and suggestion is that in case of IT sector companies, it can be concluded that the government should remove the requirement of preparing accounts on NDS basis as a result show that there is no significant difference in accounting ratios, cash flow under NDS and IFRS. So preparing two set of financial statements just leading to a wastage of time and money. India government can remove NDS and implement IFRS for IT sectors companies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ankit. Okay, nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Okay. What are the problems faced by Infosys when they are going in for preparing the two sets of NDAs and IFRS? So the basic problem is that first of all, it's a very time consuming along with time consuming is costly also. And on top of that, conversion of data, ticket, conversion of data from NAS to IFRS creates a lot of trouble for IT sector companies, especially all those sectors companies who have done over, over 500 crores. Okay, uh, how far, it, which is very advantageous to Infosys, whether NDAs or IFRS? Sir, merely as such, there is no such changes in Infosys, but if we talk about the convenience level, IFRS is much better because IFRS is nowadays accepted in all the major countries like US, United Nations, Canada, China. So when dealing with these countries, it's very convenient for countries like or companies like Infosys. So according to my research, IFRS is much better in convenience for Infosys. That's why Infosys is the only company in India which started uh, preparing its accounting and uh, preparing books of accounts in, uh, in IFRS format from uh, from the accounting year 2001 only. It is the first company which voluntarily prepares accounts on IFR basis since 2001. And Indian government has implemented IFRS, implemented uh, compulsory implementation of IFRS has done from 2016. But obviously it seems it's convenient for a uh, uh, Infosys to follow IFRS. Yeah, it is given to the convenience of the co companies whether to adopt NDAs or IFRS. Okay, but when you go in for a uh, filing of a returns with SEBI or an income tax, which is followed? What officer in this? In this, that's the reason uh, they are adopting because when you go in for your product outside the boundaries of India, then IFRS may be useful as we had ISO. But sir, as per the globalization, these companies are spreading all over the world. Well, and uniformity should be there. It will be ease for multinational companies established in India to do business all over the globe. Yes. Okay, nice. Thank you. Thank Any you, questions? Sir. We'll move on to the next. Thank you. Next participant, Arshit Singh. Arshita? Are you there? He is 
Hi ma'am hi sir hello uh, my co the manush will be presenting good morning sir good morning ma'am uh, hope my screen is visible yeah i can see you sir you are using the mobile yes sir okay fine uh, put it as uh, a full screen no fine You can go for a full screen in the mobile. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, topic for today is uh, investment awareness of young individuals with reference to uh, Bangalore City and the co-author is Akila Mohan. I am the co-author for the paper, Manoj Kumar. We are the student of uh, Saint Joseph University, Bangalore. Pursuing Master of Com. And this uh, overview of our presentation: abstract, introduction, research methodology, analysis, findings, and interpretation, and conclusion. And when it comes to investment, we can asset or item acquired with the goal of generating income or appreciation. Uh, in a country like India, people. Uh, always borrow money when they want to procure anything so in order to um, beat that uh, we start investing in investing for, for that purpose to achieve our future goals and investment also concern the outlay of some because time effort money or an okay this study focuses on finding the investment awareness of and behavior of individuals in that case and uh, this is with reference uh, we have taken uh, references the age group of 18 to 25 year and uh, uh, also to see whether their educational qualification of an investor determine uh, their investment behavior the support the invest, uh, introduction as i already said uh, investment helps to help your money grow and also to create wealth over time And in a country like India, the young population of sixty-six percent, sixty-six percent of young population, since uh, there are uh, many investment avenues that are available, the question arises uh, that uh, how many of we know that uh, there are so many investment options available? Many stick to the traditional investment options like uh, fixed deposit, gold, or real estate. When it comes, when we ask the family member, the father. We ask us to invest in uh, buy a, a piece of land, uh, buy a gold, but they don't speak about equity or share or mutual funds, etc. So uh, there are wide variety of investment vehicles that are available. Some of that are fixed deposit, mutual fund, direct equity, post office schemes, national pension pension schemes, liquid funds, etc. And the statement of the problem is: uh, this study aims to explore the awareness and attitude of young people with investment and certain investment avenues, also their risk-taking capacity. Scope of this study is focused mainly on young individuals in Bangalore, um, age group of uh, 18 to 25. The data collected through a questionnaire uh, and uh, it was distributed to 50 uh, young people in the Bangalore city. and objective of the study to know the awareness among the young people and uh, whether their educational qualification and percentage of income chosen for uh, investing uh, the study limited to only bangalore city and limited to 50 uh, young people and it is conducted within the span of 15 years the we formed the two hypotheses uh, for this research paper the first one is where there is a relationship between investment awareness and the age of respondent and by passing an anova test uh, we got a p value of 6 uh, 0.650 which is greater than the significant level of 0.05 this leads to accept of null hypothesis and predict so uh, we found out that there is a relationship between investment awareness and age of respondent The second hypothesis of the study 
Yes, uh, there, uh, there is a relationship between qualification and percentage of income chosen for investment by respondent. respondent. Even in this, uh, we got a P value of 0.531, which is greater than the significance level. So we reject the null hypothesis and accept the uh, we accept the uh, null hypothesis and reject the alternate hypothesis. That is, uh, there is no relationship between educational qualification and percentage of income. Findings of the study found that, uh, that there is relationship between investment awareness and the uh, res, uh, age of respondent and also uh, the educational qualification impacts a lot on the investment behavior. So uh, after our um, uh, interpretation and uh, collection of the data, we found out that uh, many people uh, uh, do not have uh, much financial knowledge. Uh, they don't. Uh, do EIT analysis, which is economic uh, index and company analysis when it comes to investment. They, uh, uh, they bank upon uh, uh, their friends and relatives or any any person, neighbors or uh, whom they talk to uh, and ask their uh, su suggestions and make their investment decision. But majority of, majority of time, that will not always work. They need to main focus on their uh, investment uh, research and research about the company when it comes to investment because uh, uh, when you blindly invest in some uh, stock uh, it, it, uh, it is not advisable and uh, you will end up in uh, disaster so uh, suggestions of my study uh, financial literacy plays an important role people should have an uh, understanding about companies and market condition because that's where uh, it influences the share price um, and uh, when it comes to investment uh, there is a, fa a famous quote by Einstein uh, uh, that is uh, uh, compounding interest uh, he said that compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world uh, one, who, uh, one who knows it uh, earns it, one, one who doesn't understand it, pay for it. So uh, you have to invest early uh, to get more returns in future. And also, if you have uh, many uh, financial goals, it helps you to achieve all those goals for an young individual. Conclusion, the pr primary aim of this study to uh, analyze the investment awareness about young individuals. Uh, we found out that uh, educational qualification and uh, their uh, age plays an important role in their investment decision and uh, the study was limited to 50 young people in the Thank you. Thank you. What motivated you to select this particular topic? Uh, sir, uh, we are, we are uh, finance uh, specialized uh, students and uh, we wanted to understand uh, whether uh, young people uh, are investing and because there are so many apps today uh, uh, like zero the app stock and uh, grow and paytm money and all of that um, when uh, when my brothers and sisters were there uh, uh, still now my i i think my sister and brother are uh, also not they are aware about shares and all of that but they don't have uh, knowledge about that uh, they only stick to their traditional investment uh, patterns like gold, land, etc. Uh, they don't invest in new equity or mutual fund, uh, other schemes. So uh, this uh, motivated me to take this uh, topic and uh, to understand uh, whether uh, this present generation uh, have an impact uh, uh, impact or knowledge about this uh, investment option that are available in India and whether they, uh, they have started their investment uh, to prove their future uh, and so on. Okay, how you have uh, educated your your brothers and sisters? Uh, yeah, I told um, my brothers and uh, family members like in uh, because the investment uh, for young people they can take more risk, but uh, when it comes to elderly people, uh, they they do not take much risk. They want their investment to be very much safer. They they will only invest in fixed deposit, etc. So I, uh, when 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 it comes to my sister, I told her to invest in st few uh, company stocks uh, which will perform well and uh, which is uh, 
over the period of time uh, it is uh, there well established and listed in the top 50 of the uh, uh, in the stock market so uh, the, the nifty 50 companies which there in the stock market it keeps performing well since uh, the stock price is higher people will not, the people who do not have much investment in their hand they will not uh, buy the, the higher price stock because they think it's too high but the thing is uh, the stock price may, may be high because it keeps increasing over a period of time when they invest in a long time uh, they can earn a good amount of return over a period of time so i told her to invest in few um, uh, stocks and uh, invest in mutual fund and uh, construct a portfolio that uh, so it performs differently on different market conditions so you won't end up in losses okay how to encourage the younger generations or to bring over an awareness to the younger generations is there any uh, this in the syllabus of the younger generation sir uh, now younger generation uh, according to my observation uh, now uh, few uh, not everyone but few are um, few have started investing already maybe they do not have much uh, money with them or uh they do not earn uh, in, uh, initially so um, uh, with their uh, whatever savings that they have from the uh, from or their pocket money which they have or from the earnings which they make through their part time job uh, with that they are uh, um, i have my friend who is in my, who has bought many uh, sgb sovereign gold bond 2 uh, 3 maybe maybe it cost 4 to 5000 for uh, now uh, the price is 1 to uh, 5050 something for one one uh, amount of sgb share so oh. yes uh, he has bought it and i have, i see now they have uh, uh, so media and uh, many apps are there uh, they can do their own research when it comes to investment uh, they, uh, many people think that uh, now they have money but uh, they don't know that they are losing uh, the value of it by inflation because when you invest uh, it beats the inflation when you keep your money idle it uh, the value of the money reduce uh, reduces over the period of time okay then nice presentation thank you thank you any questions we'll go to the next सर आई एम ऑडिबल या यू आर ऑडिबल सर सो इज माय स्क्रीन विजिबल हां ओके सम मोर देन आई ओके Yeah, man. Let me check. Yes, it is visible. Can you do that? Yeah, it is visible. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Hello, everyone. I am Kyle Bidi. Currently pursuing my degree, BCom degree at Madras Christian College. Here to present my research study on impact of foreign direct investment on economic growth in India under the guidance of my research guide and co-author, Dr. Mrs. Sandhya Sudhi. introduction foreign direct investment also known as cross border investment refers to the purchase of particular organizations interest by another foreign organization in which the organization is located in the different country fdi is not only brings money it also brings skills knowledge technology and employment for the development of the economy fdi plays a vital role by providing access to superior technology which promotes productivity to the existing production capacity and generate new production opportunity the next comes review of literature this study is conducted based on reviewing various various similar research studies carried out by various authors and between the recent period 2014 to 22 While reviewing the number of studies conducted on the impact of FDI, my research paper covers the impact of foreign direct investment on economic growth in India from the year 2018 to 22. 
This slide speaks about the objectives of the study, that is to evaluate the impact of FTA on Indian economy, the inflow of investment, and the trend of flow of FTA into India. The source for the study is fully based on collection of secondary data available in various sites, blogs, journals, etc., which is from 2018 to 22. Interpretation. While interpreting the data on the inflow of FTA, that shows that there is 7.14 percentage increase in the flow from the period 2018 to 19 to 2021 to 22, which is found to be continuous and stable, which in turn results in the increase in GDP from 0.89 percentage to 17.81 percentage between the period 2018 to 21. This implies that there is positive and a direct relationship between the flow of FTA into India and economic growth in India. The conclusion and recommendation. The data concludes that the flow of FTA and economic growth in India are found positively or directly proportional to each other. The recommendation is, is for the government is to take all initiative to implement more liberal policies to attract foreign direct investment into India and to take precautionary measures without ignoring its limitations. The scope for further research. The detailed study on the opportunities created by FTA and also the study on impact of FTA on economic growth in India in the upcoming years will be the further scope for the further research. Thank you, sir, for this opportunity. Thank you nice presentation okay what Thank motivated you, you to take an fdi <clears throat> so i wanted to know the uh, uh, what is the uh, relationship between the fti and economic growth whether it is advisable or uh, and its limitations to it sir okay but your your study period says about 2018 to 22 right yes sir but almost we were one and a half years in the covid period Yes, sir. So you say that from 0.89 percent, it has increased to 17.81 percent, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But one and a half years, we were totally house arrested. How the FTI has uh, increased, and what are the means where the FDI has flown to India? Sir, it is uh, the main five largest investors of FTI, sir. It's, it is through Singapore, USA, Mauritius, mm. Netherlands, Switzerland, and so on, sir. Okay. No, my question was, we were in the lo lockdown period of FDA uh, uh, during the COVID. So, yes, from what you say, the growth was uh, very enormous. It has grown to 17 point. No, sir, it is... Uh, from 2021 to 20, uh, from 2021, the growth has been declined, sir, 22. Okay. So what may be the reason? Any idea? Because of complete shutdown and there is no source to invest in India. Okay. So how was the impact on Indian economy? It gradually decreases the uh, um, it gradually decreases the GDP of India, sir. Okay then. Thank you. Any questions? Next. Thank you. The next participant, Liji George. I will not be able to Next participant, Suhail. Yes. Suhail, are you there? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, yes, you can proceed. Um. Okay, go ahead. 
Good afternoon to one and all. I am Sufil. I am doing research under the under the guidance of Professor C. Mahadev Murthy. And today's my topic. Today's my topic on the progress and growth on on-site and off-site ATMs, a comparative study of public sector, private sector, and foreign sector banks in India. When it comes to the introductions of my study. The automated teller machine is an automated banking machine which is allows customers to complete basic transaction without any help of the bank representative. Now, and what exactly on-site ATM and off-site ATM means? ATM which are situated at the premises of the bank are known as on-site ATM and the one that are located at some busy places are known as off-site ATMs like food, word, railway station, bus station, shopping malls. In these kind of places, we can see the offsite ATMs. When it comes to the review of literature, so many research it has been conducted, uh, so many research it has been conducted through, uh, towards the ATMs. Majority of the studies is focused on the customer satisfaction towards the ATM and as well as the certain studies it's focused on security issues related to ATM as well as the certain problem faced by the customers etc. These are all the studies majorly focused related to ATM. Only few studies it has been identified, only few studies it is identified on on-site as well as the off-site ATMs. Therefore, this study has been conducted. I, therefore, me as a, I have conducted this particular study, the progress and growth of, of on-site, off-site ATM. And when it comes to the methodology, when it comes to the objective of my study, these are all the objectives of my study. First one, it is to highlight the theoretical framework and different kinds of ATM services in the Indian banking sector, to highlight the growth of on-site and off-site ATMs of public sector banks, to assess the growth of on-site and off-site ATMs of private sector banks, to analyze the growth of on-site and off-site ATMs in foreign banks, and to study the comparison of growth in on-site and on-site uh, on ATMs among public, private, and foreign banks. And when it comes to the research methodology, uh, this study it is mainly based on the secondary source of data. I've used the sources of secondary data in order to study this study. Uh, from various annual publication, bulletin, trends and progress reported and speech, uh, speeches of Reserve Bank of India, uh, Indian Banking Association, uh, bulletin published by uh, Indian Banks Association and Center for the Monitoring and Indian Economy. In addition to this, articles published in journals, this is submitted to the universities. And when it comes to analyze the data, uh, in order to analyze the data, as well as in order to measure the comparative study among the public, private, and foreign sector, I have applied postdoc test to interpret the result of data. Want the first table? The first table, the to, table number one, it is represent the growth of on-site and off-site ATM. It's a public sectors, public sector banks, public sector bank concerns constitute the major role in providing electronic banks and services. The, when it comes to here, the overall growth of on-site ATMs numbering total 333,308 branches, out of that highest number of on-site ATMs numbering 67,820 branches in 2020. As again is to the lowest number of on-site ATMs numbering to 19,902 branches, 19, 19, uh, 12,902 branches, 12,902 branches in 2012 to 2013 respectively. When it comes to the second one, it is the growth of on-site off and off-site ATM, it's a private sector. Here, private sector banks plays a visual role in the providing electronic banking services. The overall growth of on-site ATM when it comes to the private bank, it's 1,62,680 branches. Out of that, the highest number of on-site ATM numbering 31,319 branches in 2020, 2021-22. As again is the lowest number of on-site ATM numbering 3,879 branches in 2012-2013 respectively. The growth of on-site ATMs in private sector bank have been recorded 28.98% growth in 2013-14 to 14, and it was increased, increased up to the 39.56% uh, in 
in the year of 2021 to 2022. In the context of overall growth of off-site ATM numbering to the uh, 2 lakh 238 branches, out of that uh, highest number of off-site ATMs numbering 38,825 branches in 2021 to 22. And we we'll move on to the foreign sector bank. And I will move on to the foreign sector bank. Foreign sector banks play, play a prime role in providing electronic banking services. The overall growth of the on-site ATM numbering 21,135 branches. Out of that, the highest number of on-site ATMs numbering 4,328 branches in 2020-21. As again is the lowest number of on-site ATMs numbering 269 branches in 2012 to 13 respectively. The growth of on-site ATM in foreign bank uh, foreign banks have recorded 8.03 percent growth in the year of 2013 to 2014, and it was decreased to 4.26 percent in the year of 2021 to 22. And when comes to the comparison comparison of on-site and off-site ATM among the public, private and foreign sector banks here, on-site and on-site, sorry, uh, depict that the comparison of on-site and off-site ATMs among the public, private and foreign banks in India. In the context of public sector bank, the overall growth of on-site and off-site ATMs are numbering 3,33,308 branches and 2,47,812 branches respectively. In the context of private sector banks, the overall growth of on-site and off-site ATMs are numbering 1,62,680 branches and 2,238,000 238 branches respectively. In the context of foreign banks, the overall growth of an on-site ATM are numbering 21,135 branches and 16,925 branches respectively. These are analysis shown that the public sector banks having highest number of on-site and off-site ATMs compared to a private as well as the foreign sector banks. When comes, when comes the table number four, a continuation. Uh, a comparison of on-site and off-site APM among the public sector, private sector, foreign banks in India, the post hoc test revealed that in case of first mean, there is a no significant difference between the variables of public sector bank to private sector bank. In there is a significant difference between a public sector bank to foreign sector banks foreign sector banks. In view of second means, there is no significant difference between the private sector banks to public sector banks and private sector banks to a foreign sector bank. In case of third means, there is a significant difference between the foreign banks to a public sector bank and private bank, uh, public sector bank and foreign sector banks to private sector bank. It comes to the finding of my study. These are all the main findings of my study. In the context of public sector banks, the, the overall growth of on-site and off-site ATMs are numbering 3,33,308 branches and 2,47,814 branches respectively. And when it comes to the, the growth of on-site ATMs in public sector banks, as recorded 38.05% 38 growth in 2013 to 2014, and it, is, it was declined to 14.32% in the year of 2021-23. In the context of private sector bank, the overall growth of on-site and off-site ATMs are numbering 1,62,680 branches and 2,238 branches respectively. The growth of on-site ATMs in private sector bank has recorded 28.98% growth in 2013-2014 and it was increased up to 39.56% in the year of 2021-22. And suggestion comes to the suggestion of uh, my state. ATM services are very important service nowadays as we are dependent so much to the ATM as well as the e-banking system. For that reason, the various suggestions for the impo improving the effectiveness of the ATM services in public and private com uh, sectors bank compared to a foreign sector banks, uh, still some more uh, improvement it has to be done under the public sector banks as well as the private sector banks. 
uh, not, not only increasing of number of branches, even they have to increase the this thing also. Uh, banks must make a concentrated effort to educate female customers to use ATM for this purpose. Bank must be hold training program for the customers from time to time. Bank may also drop up special incentive schemes to induce the customers to make maximum use of ATM. Number of banks own ATM must increase as the number of ATMs in the East. Less customers are forced to use off-site ATMs which form part, part of shared network and have to pay the higher charges after the fifth transaction in a month. Finally, come to the conclusion. After the uh, after the uh, LPG, after the LPG has been opened, economy visits the banking industry in the generation of an instantly compact competitive environment. Today, ATM, as we all know, have been popularized across the globe. The the automated teller machine has now become a part of daily life banking through ATM has not only a transformed traditional banking but also brought a paradigm shift in the attitude of banks to banking operation. The banking sector in India has to introduce e-banking in a phased manner. Foreign banks are pinures to e-banking, private banks introduced it in a big way and foreign public sector banks are in the process of transformation from the traditional banking to e-banking. The present analysis indicates the banking industry should take steps to make its ATM safe and secure uh, of its customer with the, the, these public sector banks having highest number of on-site, off-site ATM services to compare the public, private banks and foreign banks. So private sector bank and foreign sector bank that developed some strategy to improve the number of on-site and off-site ATMs branches services in India. Uh, these are all the references. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Sushil, you have presented that uh, over a period of time there was an increase in the ATMs. Yes. And after 2016, we found that in power public sector there was a decline in the eight number of ATMs. And in case of a private, there was an increase in the number of ATMs. And in case of a foreign bank, it was going towards the negativity. Yes, sir. Can you shadow something on why there was a decrease in the public sector and increase in the private sector and there was a negative in the foreign sector? When uh, when comes to the public sector, sir, why it is it decreased means uh, after pandemic in the year of 2020 afterwards, we can see uh, decrease because one thing it is a pandemic. After that, uh, after that, one more reason is the after 2017 continuously the mergers and acquisition it's also happening in the banking sector. That is the one reason the drastically offsite, offsite, onsite ATMs it has been gradually coming down. That is the one reason when it comes to the public sector bank and private sector. No, as we all know, uh, the numbers of uh, uh, offsite as well as onsite brand, uh, onsite ATMs are gradually increasing. But when it comes to the foreign sector bank, why it is gradually decreasing means because the number of branches only they have very less. When it comes to the Karnataka only, sir, we have only uh, we have uh, 29 district, we have 30 district when it comes to the Karnataka. But when it comes to the foreign sectors bank are situated only uh, uh, they have a foreign Northern sector areas. Bank, only two only two cities. That one it is Bangalore and another one it is a Darwar. In rest of the district, they don't have a, any other. We can't see any kind of a foreign sector branch branches. That is a one reason. And even they not, they don't have a, a off on-site ATMs also in uh, in any other districts. That is a one reason, sir. They are not increasing the they are not increasing the number of branches. For that reason, they are growing under the decline stage. Okay, it may be due to the microfinance banks also, which is playing yes. a major role in the yes, private sector. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay, we'll move on to the next. The next participant. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, could I please present next because I'm constantly using internet connectivity. So, can okay. I please present? Okay, Kartika. Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, Okay, ma'am, thank you. Uh, shall I share my screen? Yeah, it's it visible? Yeah, it is visible. Okay, uh, so let me start off. My name is Ashla. 
So, uh, now talking, let's come to the part of India. Now, India actually has one of the fastest growing economies in India, but it's still actually not moving forward when it comes to accessing formal credit. Now, the reasons for these, there are a couple of reasons. This is mostly because of the literacy rate. Uh, the, the literacy rate being very low in our country. And the other reasons why is because 40% of them do not have a bank account. And also technology plays an important role in the banking sector. So India has not uh, progressed as much compared to other countries. So uh, now we will be coming back to the research paper. So in this research paper, the purpose of this uh, study was conducted to find the purpose of the research pattern of people, in, uh, of the credit cards of people in Bangalore city urban. The, and the other purpose was also the awareness among people in Bangalore city. So this uh, research was conducted in Bangalore and a study sample of 100 respondents was collected and it utilized primary data and secondary data. Primary data was conducted by mostly surveys, by constructed uh, sorry, structured questionnaire and interview method. Secondary data was uh, collected through via books, magazines, journals and the So. Um, now let's come down to the data analysis and the interpretation. So when I went on uh, to interview a couple of uh, uh, citizens, these are the couple of questions that I did ask them. So the first question was how many people are fully aware about uh, how a credit card fully works? So uh, the results I got was around 27 of them were unaware and around 73% was aware about it. And the second one was what consumers spend on uh, spend on using a credit card. So I asked them and uh, what are the things that they would purchase if they did use a credit card. 42% uh, of them uh, answered electronics. 33 told me that they would spend it on travel. 17% told me that they would spend it on groceries and 8% on luxury items that is not necessarily something that they need, but it's something that they want. And the third uh, question that was asked was how much of their income do they spend monthly paying back the credit card company? So I think around 56% uh, of them told me that they would spend 10 to 15% of their income and 11% uh, told me that they would spend 5 to 10% of their income. 10% of them told me they would spend 20 to 25% of their income. 23% told me that they would spend 10, 15 to 20% of their income. And the last and the final question was, how many times a month do you use a credit card? So 43% uh, of them told me thrice, and 32% of them told uh, more than twice. 20% of them, uh, percent of them told once, and 5% of them told uh, twice. So uh, let's come to the final conclusion or what are the findings of my study. Um, so first point was uh, what the majority of the people were aware about how to use a credit card and the benefits and disadvantages it has from using uh, over it irresponsibly. Majority of the credit card users are employed and living on a monthly income. And uh, so they have a day to, so monthly salary they get, they're mostly salary people. And major, majority of the credit card users spend money using credit card to pay for items that they need or that they need and not want, exactly, like luxury items. So uh, most of the respondents uh, spend very little of their income on paying back the credit card company. So uh, this is my uh, presentation. So. Hello. Hello. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so I come to an end to my presentation. Okay. Nice. So, can I ask, raise a question? Uh, yes, sir. Sure. You said 27 percent are not aware about the credit card. Can you? Yes. What is the age group? So it was. Uh, so these were mostly uneducated people or people who are over the age of 65. Credit card. Okay, I thought. Yes, yeah, so these the were the people group? who were. Yeah, the younger people were aware about how it works and uh, what, like they already knew what they would want to spend it on. But it's mostly the. Uh, illiterate people, like towards the villager side, and also people who are over the age of 65. Okay, I thought the younger generation, because now you have the Google Pay, PayPal, and all these things, are only linked with the debit card and not with the credit card. I thought that may be the answer. Okay, good. Uh, no, so actually, yes. Yes, I mean. Yes, sir. So even when you do any transaction as simple as buying a meal for one uh, time, so you can actually use uh, your card, but they would give it to you on a credit basis. So you can always pay it back later. So that's like how this. they know the functioning of how a credit works. So, um, yes. Okay, whether uh, the credit card or the debit card, which is very much used by the respondents. So most of them are uh, debit cards. Okay. How to uh, give an awareness about the credit card? Any ideas? So I think uh, the government can take some of uh, some initiatives by making advertisements to uh, help the citizen be more aware about it. And also the credit card company, I feel like they don't give you uh, enough information when you're either purchasing a credit card. So I think we have to promote credit card companies to be more uh, open and uh, to tell about how it works instead of just uh, promoting to them they should tell the workings of it and how, what's the payback period is. Okay then, any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Next participant. Thank you. The next participant, Leji George. Actually, she was there, so uh, I don't know where she went. Okay, next. Uh, Okay, then we shall we close? Are you presenting Uma Mageshwari? Shall we close now? Uh, so actually, Lady George has came, but we are, I don't know where she went. Hmm. I think the name of Nasrat Fatima was not there. I have included, right? Ah, yes, sir. She uh, told to call, sir. Yes, sir. I think she called. So we'll end it? Okay, Can we wait for a few minutes, sir? For us? Okay, 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 okay. She is not here. Only ten of them are there. Nine. Nice. Yes, to rejoin. Okay, with this, we'll come to the conclusion of the technical session number three, I think, of finance. So it was a good presentation from the participant side with the 
lot of innovative uh, thinkings about so some of them have brought down about the gst some of them about the uh, bank assurances electric vehicles mm -hmm. and the gst on construction and real estate real estate things and uh, how to develop the investment awareness among the younger generations so that they'll become the future generation and how a foreign direct investment is affecting the income of a country that is india and how to go in for mobilization i think that is what lithi jaja asked us so it was a good session and i thank the management the principal the head of the department then prin professor in charge sakiran morgan sir everyone for giving me this opportunity of uh, for heading the technical session of pre finance thank you one and all thank you sir thank you it gives me pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for our today's technical session uh, chief guest dr bharati dasan sir who honored this session with his inspirational thoughts so i extend my vote of thanks to all the paper presenters and participants over here once again i thank so and i request each participant to join the valedictory session at 4 pm the link will be shared in the whatsapp group shortly i repeat i request each participant to join the valedictory session at 4 pm the link will be shared in the whatsapp group shortly thank you thank you sir shall i leave मिनिमे <laughs> 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 